Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I apologize. I could not be present yesterday because of uh, due to educative uh, executive education I was doing there, etc. So I'm here for the first day. And I guess that many things I will allude to had already been discussed. So this is one of the problems maybe we can have. But, um, well, listening to, the, to some presentations this morning, um, uh, the discussion has been oriented towards uh, a problem I really think very serious when I think um, maybe it's a problem. I think there is not any theoretical solution or answer to the question of the relations between business and the common good. I tried to, to tell you why and how and to what extent, but maybe the conclusion, the consequence is not so problematic, is that our responsibility is not theoretical. Our responsibility is how do we do things? No, how do we claim to do them, but how do we do them? And I'll try to show that there is kind of a misunderstanding, and this is why I choose the title, um, A Genealogy of a Confusion. I think there is a confusion uh, or a problem, an intellectual problem which favors practical difficulties. And the problem is the following. Um, by the way, a methodological point, I, I, I generally don't use PowerPoint. I don't like slides because I think they, you know, there is a constraint in the slides. You cannot change and innovate in your presentation. So I will not follow them, actually. Uh, <laughs> I will show some of them, but not all of them. Uh, so I will skip <laughs> so two, two or three of them. But I'd like to insist on one previous point. I, I go straight to, 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 to a first provocative point, which is the following. Um, if you, yeah, OK, let's, let's, remi let's remind th this very famous statement of uh, Friedman. The corporate social responsibility is to increase its profit. I think, of course, this is a right statement. Because when a company increases its profit, it makes money, and it can hire people, develop employment, contribute to richness and common good, of course. But the stake is not common good as such. It's making money, just that's all. And I think, theoretically, this is grounded. No problem. I have no personal problem with getting money. And I think <laughs> company, uh, nobody has problem with getting money. Also, money, you have a problem with giving it? I am a company. You, 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 can, you can help me. <laughs> okay. But um, I, I'll give you an example. I've been working for uh, an, uh, um, uh, um, a non profit organization in France which is called Atelier de Carmonde. Atelier de Carmonde helps people who really are really poor, misery. And they behave, you know, they cannot be rich because they help poor people. But that's false. They should give them money. I mean, they should help them enriching, not getting poor. So my point is, it's not a problem getting money. But the problem is how th theorists can publish these kind of statements and to what extent are they responsible? So to what extent are we responsible for the consequences of what we publish? And why? Because I, I, tr I tried to write it here. People who practice managers um, entrepreneurs take into account very seriously this kind of, of statements. So they make money, that's all. And they become uh, more and more selfish with good conscience. I have a theorist who told me that I was right making mon money and making profit. I will only need to think of making profit. And on my point of view, this is a theoretical responsibility. What I mean is that academics, scientists, need to think of their responsibility. What do they make public? So the problem is not being right or wrong. Again, I really think here this statement is a right one to a certain extent. But the consequence, the, the question is, should we publish it? Maybe not. Because in companies, people become selfish with good conscience again. And I tell you, there is a much deeper misunderstanding, which is older. Um, there, is, there was a very good discussion, on my, my, a very good presentation on my point of view uh, given this morning, and we had three really very deep discussions. And one of the stake was, what is the anthropology uh, on which economics are grounded? And there is a new economic science, and I think the anthropology has been created, and I think many people agree on this, and I know there was a discussion here uh, on, on this, but... There is an anthropology which was created in, during the Renaissance in Europe, and the first political philosopher who invented it was Thomas Hobbes. And I think we should trace back our questioning on the notion of common good to Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes' statements are very simple. I think many people know them. Uh, everybody here 
I think, knows them. But I think sometimes it's interesting to, to make them clear again. Um, Thomas Hobbes writes clearly against ancient political philosophy. And he wants to destroy ancient political philosophy assumptions and evidences. And he was, uh, consequently, he attacks Aristotle. Aristotle was the, the main authority in his epoch and uh, his period. And he, says, he, he states that humans, contrary to what Aristotle thought, humans are but three equal uh, rational individuals. This is the natural state of humans. And he has very good reasons to state this way, because he says, OK, we have to assume that people, and this is very important, do not depend on any specific physical characteristic. You can be a man, a woman, a children, an adult. You can be black, white, etc. No problem. Every human is equal. Handicapped people, etc. There was a discussion previously in the other room on handicap, etc. It's very important. And Hobbes assumes that everybody is equal. It, he's the first one to do so. And what is his objective? It's very interesting. His objective is to say, OK, if we assume that people are equal, free, rational individuals, what will happen? Sooner or later, they will have to agree to create a stable state. If they do not agree, they will have good reasons to destroy the state, the existing state, and they will have good reasons to fight against the common good. But if we assume that they agree in the creation of a state, a common good, or the institution which responsibility will be to guarantee the common good, we can guarantee a stability which will help the common good. So his objective is very generous, positive. By the way, he's writing during civil war and he wants to recreate conditions of stability in England, etc. There is ambiguity, of course. Hobbes can be used to favor tyrannies, absolute power, the Leviathan power is an absolute power, potentially. But as this has been discussed previously here, the great successor of Thomas Hobbes, I did not write here, it was John Locke. And John Locke, of course, continued Hobbes' anthropology. And he stated something very important. He separate, he, he disagreed with Hobbes on one point. He said, people are entitled to make revolutions. Locke is radically modern. Hobbes starts to process, but Locke uh, continues and deepens the, the, the decision, which means that individuals who are free, equal, rational, create a state. And on Locke opinion, the state objective will be to protect the private property. So the public good is not so important, actually. The common good is to guarantee the private goods. I mean, the common, the objective of the state will be to protect individuality, which symbolizes by private property. My point is the following, is that Independently of the, of the empirical consequences of these, the basis, the very anthropological basis of modern economics implies that the notion of common good is not natural. This is the most important point from our perspective. We, I would say that our common ground, our paradigmatic anthropology, is that we are humans who are individuals, who are rational, who are equal to each other and who are selfish. The first modern assumption is that we, are self we need to defend ourselves as individuals. But this means that even if we integrate states, we remain individuals. And the notion of common good is not natural at all. What is natural is being selfish. And this is a problem. On my point of view, this is a problem. I tell you why and how and to what extent is that even if this was a theoretical assumption, by the way, it's necessary to say that when philosophers have been working on the natural state of humans, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, etc., they never said it existed. Rousseau tried more or less, and he says, I am a good sauvage, and so on. And he was having solitary walks and thinking, I am the good, you know, wild man. And so on. But no, that's only sentiment. He knows it's not true. It's an, artifi an artifact, an, artifi an artificial construction. But what happened? People believed it. And here we are again with intellectuals or philosophers' responsibility. They published something and people believe it. So Hobbes published, people are selfish and we believe it. Wow, we are selfish. Wait, great, let's make war. And <laughs> the problem is that this becomes true. We are actually, in, in our current world, we are creating the conditions of what? 
of what Hobbes said very clearly, that we are in a struggle for life. You remember, Hobbes said in Latin, homo homini lupus. Man is a, a, a wolf for, is that a wolf? Yeah? <laughs> for, 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 well, humans are wolf, wolves for humans. But we are coming to this. Globalization is but the natural state of Hobbes. So we are free, we are equal, we are rational, and we are fighting each other. We are making a, civil, a worldwide civil war. Interesting. On my point, this is a problem, a real problem. We forget about common knowledge. But the problem deepens. So first, the first statement is, there was a radical change in anthropology when new political sciences were born. And new political sciences are economical ones. I mean, the process through which intellectually humans decide to build the state through the social contract is a construction which is a rational anticipation. So the theory of anticipations and the rationality is grounded on this first decision, the social contract. But the ground remains an anthropology of selfishness. But may, uh, put it positively is an anthropology of freedom, individual, rational, equal, and free people. But the consequence is people fighting each other, sooner or later. And the argument is, um, we ca can be put, uh, put in two ways. First, you will always have scarce resources. And nowadays we are discovering we will lack energy, we will lack water, we will lack metal, <coughs> we will lack petrol. So resources are finite and our desires are infinite. And second, we always want what the other has. And Hobbes is very clear with this. The desire is always desiring what the other desires. René Girard deepened the theory of people desiring what others want. So only for these two reasons, people fight each other. So we are free, but we are soldiers. Independently of sexes, of ages, of ethnies, etc., etc. No problem. Everybody. So this is the problem of modern political thought. So the question could be, why not coming back, going back to the ancient political philosophy? So let's have a look to this. What did ancient political philosophy say? How Aristotle states, what are the most important statements of Aristotle in this? Um, classical political philosophy is problematic for our culture because Aristotle says, for instance, that humans are, you know, this is very, very well renowned, political animals. So first animals and sometimes political. And being animals, on Aristotle, good sense, you know, simple way to understand things is very, very conservative. People need to make love in order to reproduce. No, qu no, no, no question on this. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe we, are, we are inventing new, new, condi new biotechnological conditions. Maybe we will get rid of making love. Wonderful. Thanks to technologies, we will get rid of heterosexuality and heterosexual, you know, um, uh, meaning to reproduce. But Aristotle doesn't think so, and he thinks people need to make love, which means that the radical bound, the initial, the, 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 uh, I mean, political life starts, begins by family life. And not homosexual or only one, with one parent, etc., but with two people who have different sexes. Because meeting, they can reproduce. If not, they cannot. So he says, this is the first political link. And then, gathering families with families, you have clans. Gathering clans with clans, you have villages. Gathering villages with villages, you have cities. Gathering cities with cities, you have nations. And nations with nations, you have empires. And then the global world. So maybe this is kind of a good <coughs> sense. I tell you to what extent I think, personally, this deserves to be thought again. Is that at the start, the beginning of politics, love. That's not so problematic. People making love That's against war, you know. It's, of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to, uh, I, I overdo the form, but of course it's a problem because people knew, of course, that making love, they could produce citizens in order to make war. If you do not reproduce, you cannot have the people to defend the community. So in order to make war, you need to make love. This is a, a bit more sad. But independently of this point, which is a very serious one, is that at the root of ancient political philosophy, you have the link. It was interesting, um, talking of care, there was a, a, an illusion that care 
is supposed to be um, rooted on mother's sentiment. Of course, this is a very archaic sentiment that women have the in instinct of protecting you know, the, the breeds and children, etc. Of course, maybe this, this may be false. But anyway, at the root of ancient political philosophy, you have the link, not the separation, not individuals, not war, but love. I mean, we can translate more, more moderately community. People sharing objectives and sharing community. I mean, sharing common good, maybe. But everybody knows that why was ancient politi political philosophy forgotten? Because, of course, it implies many problems. Aristotle as well says, men are superior to women. Masters are superior to slaves. Parents are superior to, uh, to children. Greek people are not barbarians. Barbarians, sorry. So y there is a hierarchy, and this is, of course, we cannot admit it anymore. This is, a, this is a real problem of ancient political philosophy. This means that ancient political philosophy has its problem as well. And my point is the following. I think we, could, we should think that maybe the two options, ancient political philosophy rooted on the notion of bound, rooted on maybe love, heterosexual or not heterosexual, thanks to biotechnologies, we do not need any more heterosexual meeting, maybe. And I'm serious with this. But there is the link. This is very important, the relation. Ancient political philosophy starts with relation, people relating with each other. And it's strange enough that we forgot it so much that we, we need to reinvent the notion of relation and we call it care. My point is that care, I think, is an artificial need to rediscover that the link is possible. And we forgot that link is possible because the anthropology, the modern anthropology makes us forget about it. And the spontaneous assumption is we are selfish, so how can we link with, uh, with, with each other? This is a new question, well, 400, year, 400 years old question. And my point is the following, the consequence is we should Think of the two models as, as two, not irreducible, but indomitable models, I think. We, they have their limits. The, the classic model, of course, has its limits. Hierarchy, power, um, uh, the, 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 of course, it's machist model, to a certain extent, of course. But Aristotle is much more subtle than I think is believed generally. Uh, as well on slavery. I reworked on, on the notion of slavery, etc. It's very, very strange. I think he doesn't believe radically in slavery, neither in the hierarchy between men and women. Uh, the, in the, 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 his, his book on politics, the book one, is very interesting on this. But nevertheless, ancient political philosophy rooted on, on community implies that people are not free and there are hierarchies. But we know in organizational theory that we need hierarchies, we need power or authority or leadership, but how? This is another question. And modern political philosophy, of course, ground, well, uh, uh, implies that we are equal, so we are able to discuss to each other, but the problem is we struggle for life, we, we are in war, and the problem is for what for? And what kind of common good can emerge from this anthropology? This is a real question. M my perspective, I think, is that we should try to understand both models together. Currently, we are only there. And this is why we are questioning the relations between business and the common good. In this perspective, business economics are included in, economy, in political life. Political life not related to elections, but political life considered in how do we live together. And this was a natural question for ancient political approach. And due to the notion of natural state of humans, hopes and consequences, we forgot that we are as... Ge we are generous as well as selfish. We are not only selfish. Even Radu Vrancenu is not only selfish. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for this. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everybody who claims for the economy of, uh, uh, of liberty, freedom, liberalism, we are not only selfish. That's, uh, that's not true. And we are not only generous neither, but we are both of them. And I think that tracing back our sentiments to these two perspectives is very fruitful. This is my point. So I would conclude saying this. I don't know whether, uh, how much time I, I, I have uh, more, but I would... Thank you. <laughs> I would say this, that these models are not only theoretical, 
And they are not only historical, and they do not only concern big communities or a civilization, they concern each individual. In our hearts, we are, from time to time, classic and modern. When we are parents, of course, very often we behave in this way. When we, we, we tell our children, don't do this, you should do this, you should go to school and work, etc. Of course, we are this way. And we do not admit that children are equal to parents. Not immediately. But when we are with adults here, this room, of course, we are here. Or we would be wrong to be here. So we are here. And we discuss between adults. But this is, is, is never evident. We have to renegotiate our perspectives each time. And on this perspective, I would say, and I come back to my first point, there is not any theoretical solution on my perspective. I think, maybe I'm wrong, I think there is not any theoretical solution to this tension between ancient political approach and modern political approach. But there are pragmatic answers. I alluded to this, um, alluding to decision-making dynamics and processes. I'm working a lot on Carl Weick, uh, studies on decision-making processes in crisis situation. It's very interesting how he, uh, he makes clear that you need as well competencies, routines, conserv conservative approach, uh, you know, expertise, taken for granted evidences, and capacity to invent, to innovate, to create new situations as well. But you need both of them. And I think each of us needs to integrate the two possibilities, getting rid of slogans, of ideologies. And this last time, to just to say, academics are responsible for what they make public. I hope I took my responsibilities and I, I'm ready to, answer to, to try to answer to your questions and indignations. Thank you. Okay.